biggest mistakes I made. When I was in college, you had two options. You went to Vietnam or you got married. I got married. I should have gone to Vietnam. <laughs> That's uh, the, uh, my involvement with the military has been primarily through ROTC in college and an abiding respect for the mission and the rigor and the training and the dedication and the sacrifice. And I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart how much I appreciate the wonderful mission that you guys have done. So that be it. Okay. Master Sergeant, first slide. Master Sergeant came into his group of new recruit, recruits and said, do you know the difference between ignorance and apathy? And the new recruit said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there a clicker? Because I'm, I'm going to go through these things. Here I just, oh, here we go. That's the, the right one. Perfect. There we go. Okay, we're in the middle of a perfect storm. And the perfect storm is going to cause more change in the world in the next three to five years than ever before in the history of man. And it's going to be around education. It's going to be around a population of the world being able to accelerate what they know, how they learn it, in a way that would be inconceivable. We think that we're going to know more about education and learning than at any other time because for the first time, we have the tools in place. The perfect storm is driven by cheap hardware, robust networks, some software, and brain science. You say, brain science? What do you mean? Well, it turns out that I started this sojourn, this, this journey, by trying to figure out how do people learn? And I started looking at, you know, there's about a, a million and a half doctor thesis from people with PhDs in education. There's nobody home. It's all about process. It's not about the fundamental brain sometimes. So then I started going into the medical community and, and the brain researchers and the, the psychology and the physiology and all of a sudden, this richness, they actually know an awful lot about how we learn. And the two sides don't talk. So I decided, hey, let's fix that by really trying to put it all together. The key to learning is actually enthusiasm. You say, what? No. But it turns out that you have, that, that if you have a little bit of enthusiasm that all of a sudden it becomes the first driver. And one of the things that the military does really well is they get this sense of rah rah sis boom ba enthusiasm that is a really powerful precursor. And if we could put some of that metric into our inner cities, it would be really valuable. But that's another point. Um, I always like this quote, and uh, but now I want to talk, talk a little bit about what's a game. <clears throat> well, it turns out that a game is not pretty pictures and and necessarily 3D worlds, so that can be a part of it. But a game really is about timing and stress. Yeah, stress. And it's about creating a framework by which your brain is stimulated maximally. Now, 
they say, well, if you're stimulating the brain maximally, why do, you know, what does that have to do with education? Well, it turns out that when you are maximally stimulated, you get to a better spot than ever before. When you have games providing education, you embark on the innovation cycle. There is no real innovation cycle in a classroom because you're dealing with a collective that have very, very many different goals, aspirations, capabilities. And so therefore, to innovate to one of those people is to leave either partially part of the classroom behind, part of the classroom is bored. And having this world in which half the class is bored and the other half is lost, and one person being taught to speak, is on its face really stupid. We also have big data analytics. And when you have big data analytics, all of a sudden big data has this wonderful thing of answering questions that you didn't even ask. And that's really powerful. Now, this sounds a little bit disjointed, but I'm actually trying to build a platform for where this revolution is going to really be exciting. We're teaching the wrong things in the wrong way. And you say, well, what, what do you mean? What's the right way? <clears throat> Student todays are wired differently. We have different brains than we had 10 years ago. And our kids have very different brains. And so the, the metrics of the past not only are old fashioned, but they just fundamentally won't work. Now, today, this is our kids meeting for coffee. <laughs> this is our kids getting together for dinner. <laughs> this is fun at the museum. And this is fun at the beach. Now, what does that tell you? This is really different. Oh, this is fun game. Uh, what we're doing is we are looking at this as a distraction. When in fact, they actually are getting some feelings about creativity, enthusiasm, and optimism because they are shopping every minute and every day for not just their entertainment, but their inner information. The world, the teachers, the establishment is losing control. And yet the, the student is empowered like never before. The question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Does, you know, you, what you have to do is you can't really judge it. You only can possibly hold on to it and be drug, and dragged along. Is it drug along? Dragged along. I've always had a problem with that. Anyway, you know what I mean. We have to adapt to them. We have to adapt to them because the, the the, uh, you know, the, the box has been opened, Pandora's box has been opened, and we can't get it closed. So, what do we know about how kids are playing, paying their time? Is that learning has to be adaptive, it has to be active, it has to be personal, it has to be mastery-based, and it has to have game dynamics. And the game dynamics are real simple. Aggressively timed. That's one of the characteristics of the game. Why? When you have aggressive timing, you have hypervigilance. If you know that the clock is coming down, you are hypervigilant. Hyper that is really, really important because if you're not vigilant, you're not going to be impressing things on your brain in the appropriate way. If it's active, you're engaging your thalamus. And if you're responding every six seconds, if you put a person into an fMRI and you show them a lecture, 
You know, like, if you guys were all in an fMRI right now, listening to my speech, nothing would be happening. Your brains would be fundamentally dead. <laughs> um, bothers me, but, I, but that's what the research says. Anyway, the minute you, add, oh, that goes for a lecture, goes for a movie, goes for a book. Pack, books are actually passive. So what, what, what makes your fMRI look light up? Ask a question. Force somebody to say, oh, this or this, this or this, this or this. All of a sudden, everything lights up. That's the key. If you're not, you know, judge a piece of educational software, not on the exposition mode, but on its active mode. What happens 10 seconds before you ask a question, 15, or 10 seconds after? That's where all the action is. That's where all the fun is. Now, I said that you had to have timing for hypervigilance. Well, it turns out we're not all wired the same way. Some of us are slower than others. And so it has to be adapted so that the timing is right for you. And believe it or not, it has nothing to do with intelligence. It has to do with the basics of what we're doing. For example, I have eight children. I know that's excessive, but I'm really happy. <laughs> and, uh, and I have five sons who all are gamers. Big surprise on that. <laughs> uh, and actually, three of my daughters play games somewhat, but they play different games, and they're really bad at them. But, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but it turns out that you lose a millisecond of reaction time every year that you're older than 18. So at my age, I have a serious handicap. <coughs> but if the game has stealth and guile or duplicity, I win. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't talk about your kids when I'm going to from that. We, we like to play board games. And I cheat. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and my, my kids one day said, Dad, you know, I don't think you're a good role model. <laughs> and I said, why? He said, well, you cheat. I said, no, I was trying to teach you counter espionage. What I want you to do, you know, if you, you know, I'd have been really disappointed if you hadn't caught me, you know. But I believe that one of the things that you need to know as a, an adult is how people that you may even trust, which is probably not me, but will cheat. And you have to be aware of it. Because, unfortunately, that's life. And, uh, anyway, that, that, that way off topic. <laughs> now make engagement. The reason the fMRI lights up, the reason it's so good for your brain is because you're engaging your thalamus. And it's really about the video game dynamics. The thalamus sits right on the top of your brainstem. This is the technical interlude. Anyway, um, it's the red thing there. And it's like the switch, the, 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 uh, the, the switching section of your, of your brain. And whenever you decide to do something, it has to go through the thalamus. And it's the one item that if damaged, you don't wake up. A lot of people think that's, it's either the thalamus or the hippocampus, where your soul lives, if you believe in the soul. And, um, but it turns out that if you can get that little organ 
engaged. You learn really a lot better than you remember it better. This has been repeated over and over and over again. So we're about 10 minutes in. And so less than 50% are paying attention. <laughs> Would all you guys that aren't paying attention stand up? <laughs> I don't I don't want to I don't want to know. There's a TED talk that I, you know, as homework assignment. I want you to go to the TED talk on flow. It's online. This guy is from a guy called Mikai. I've always said Chichi Mihai, but last night at dinner I really said that that's wrong. What was it? Chichi Mihai. Say, stand up. What? Chichi Mihai. Chichi Mihai. Okay. It's an impossible, I think it's, it's um, Serbian. Hungarian. Hungarian. <laughs> and, and there are way too many consonants and not nearly enough verbs. Anyway. Anyway, it was great because all of a sudden he came at the world in a position of happiness. Now, happiness, he found out, doesn't have to do with six blondes and a bottle of Jack Daniels. It, or, or whatever. <laughs> I diverge again. Um, but it has to do with accomplishment. That if you are working on something right to the edge of your capability, not too hard, not too soft, that you're in this flow zone where you lose scent lose part of your <coughs> sense of self. You don't think of yourself anymore. You're so focused on your project. And that is, by all of the definitions that he had of happiness, as happy <coughs> as you're ever going to be. It also happens that that's what we try for in video games. When we design a video game, we try to make it addictive. <laughs> and if we do, we make a lot of money. <laughs> I will deny that. <laughs> anyway, um, our objective is to use these video game cheats to make learning as addictive as video games. All students are different. I always like this one. If you judge a fish by his ability to ride a bicycle, he will spend his life thinking he's stupid. That's actually by Albert Einstein. He was one smart dude. Thank you. There was a Walter Isaacson, you know, he, he did the, the Steve Jobs biography. He did one on, on uh, Einstein that I just finished reading. It's a delightful read, and I highly recommend it. Okay, let's see. History based, I'm getting this up. Okay, no, no grades. Grading is inherently flawed. Why should you allow somebody to only learn half the material or two thirds of the material? Because so much of learning is, in fact, additive. And so, time after time after time, you see a C student turning into a C student, turning into a C student, cannot get out of that rut because they are constantly behind the eight ball. So, oh, this is be different grades. Anyway, trips around the sun. You shouldn't have first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. People learn at different speeds at different times of maturity, particularly in first grade, second grade, third grade. And it really doesn't matter. And you create some psychic damage. When I was in first grade, I was in the blue reading group. Everybody knew that the blue reading group were the dumbbells. 
and I was mortified. Well, it turns out that the males in my family, my sons, my father, all are massively dyslexic, which means that we don't read well when we're six years old, like at all, and without a certain amount of intervention, which I did with my kids. And my dad, as an adult, could not read or write. I got my first business experience because he would take me to work with him to read for him. He was massively you know, embarrassed by that. Ran a very successful construction company, could multiply three digits uh, by three digits in his head. Um, but because of his dyslexia, he dropped out of school in the fifth grade. And, you know, he had dyslexia at a time when it hadn't been invented yet. And, and so it was, it was one of those things that there are a lot of things that are going on. And why, if my mother had not really focused in on me and got me to read at that level in the second grade, I think I might have been psychically scarred. I probably was psychically scarred. I just don't realize it. Anyway. Um, and so mastery based is the direction that you have to go. So if you're looking at your systems, and if you're giving A, B, C, D, get rid of it. It's the wrong system. It's the wrong way. It's the, you, you, everybody needs to get 100% or you can't move on. Spaced repetition algorithms. Your brain is designed to forget, not to remember. You have to trick it in order to remember. Now think about that. It turns out that until you start repeating something, it will not stick. <coughs> so we've all been to cocktail parties, introduced to somebody, you immediately forget. At least I do. What you want to do is when you're introduced to somebody, have a little few pleasantries, and before they walk away, say, what was your name again? That's two. If you can engage that person during the night once more and ask them their name one more time, or repeat it to yourself if you do happen to remember it, that's three. If you can get their business card, and go over it the following morning after 24 hours, you probably have that person's name for somewhere between a week and 30 days. You then need another review. This works every time. Because space repetition is the way our brain remembers. Now, it turns out that with space repetition algorithms, that the timing of the repetition expands throughout time. <clears throat> so any software that you have needs to have a timing component in the future. I believe that if we can create a system in which everything that you know is in your brain inventory, so now we have an inventory of what's in your brain. We also know when we need to review it. I believe that once you're an adult, 22, 23, 24, that if you spend as little as one hour a week, you will be able to maintain 100% of everything that you learned in high school and college. Think about that. That's pretty remarkable. But you have to have periodic reviews, you have to be updated, and you have to do some wonderful stuff. But it needs the brain inventory. And the way that you do that is through learning a lot of that through software. Teachers are in an impossible position. They have to be extremely capable. And not to diminish in any way the teacher, but the reason you can always get a great hamburger at McDonald's 
is not because they have really great, well-trained employees that are hyper-capable and are all PhDs. No. It's because their system is so foolproof that they can take mediocre employees and turn them into excellent pieces in the puzzle to create a great hamburger and wonderful fries. So much of what is going on right now is focused on finding and training the best teachers in the world. It's an impossible job. Think about the number of teachers that could, can really teach, but they're really not a good entertainer. They're not a good disciplinarian. You can't teach if, you, if you've got chaos going on in, in your classroom. And that's, if you've got 30 kids in a classroom that are hopped up on testosterone and, and uh, <coughs> other more illicit drugs. Um, there's a judge, there's a clerk, there's a mental, and there's a drill sergeant. You know, a lot of software basically wants to put a teacher in a box. Not the right way. <laughs> what you really want to be able to do is teach many of the things electronically and then let the teacher be a mentor without worrying about being the disciplinarian or the entertainer or the judge. Remember when I talked about no grades, not the drill instructor, not the clerk. All of these things can be taken out of the system so that all of a sudden, all we have to do is focus on what that can this teacher learn? Now let me pose a question. What is an easy teacher and what is a hard teacher? In a world in which the student is shopping for the teacher, but the teacher is not giving the grade. Today, if you talk about an easy teacher, Generally, your high school student will say, and sometimes your college student will say, oh, case A, no homework. That's an easy teacher. Has nothing to do with the learning objective. In a world in which it's mastery-based, totally self-driven, the teacher that will be chosen will be the teacher that can teach, that can make clear. And that's where I talk about losing control and yet gaining power. When the student is empowered, everything gets better. Because it's bottom up, not top down. Kids want education because they have goals. And the goals can be imparted by cheerleading, not necessarily by force, intimidation, hostility. We're also moving away from a credentialed society. And um, anyway, let's get on with this. Bloom's cognitive domain, computers and technology can generally go pretty much to the top, to the bottom three levels. Up in the upper side, software can do some of it. But I think we need Socratic discussion, decisions, things like that in some of the upper parts. <coughs> now let's talk about creativity, which is where most of the real competition in the workplace is going to happen in the next 20 years. We actually train out creativity. <coughs> Kids start out massively creative. Kindergarten on, on, on creative structured tests. And by the time they're adults, all of their creative spirit is taken out. What is playful? Turns out playful, many of the characteristics of playful is actually creative. So if you have an adult that's not playful, they have self identified as being creatively disadvantaged. The, uh, 
<laughs> you can't quite do this, you know. Um, and and so I'll talk to you about my book in a, in a while. But I just I just uh, published a book called Finding the Next Steve Jobs, and it turns out that I was the only guy that gave Steve Jobs a job, and uh, he was difficult, but uh, but very very valuable. And when we're talking about mistakes, um, I had a chance to own a third of Apple computer for fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> uh, I said no, and I regret it. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's another story for another time. But Steve and I became pretty good friends, and it turns out that creativity is really as much about passion and 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 and, uh, and exuberance and action. People who do a lot of things take some risks are considered creative. Think about that. One of the best ways to instill creativity is projects. This is a thing called Maker Fair. If you're not aware of it, get aware of it. And it is where kids and adults make stuff and come and show it off. And it is growing by leaps and bounds. And it is maybe as much a celebration of creativity and activity. Whenever I want to say, do I have any, any chance or do I have a belief in the next generation? Make Your Fair just injects me with a, with a creative high that is extraordinary. Let me tell you an interesting thing about creativity. There was a pottery class that was usurped by the, uh, the, the psychology department. They said, I'd like you to do something for me. The left side of the classroom, we want to judge on the best pot that, they, that a person could do. They only have to do one pot. They get their A, B, C on one pot. On the other side of the classroom, we're going to give A, B, C, D based on the weight of the pots that are created. We want quantity. We want as many pots as they can possibly turn out in the time of Very interesting thing happened. All the great pots, judged by creativity, outcome, style, all came from the side of quantity, not quality. What does that tell you? It tells you that you, if you're willing to take risks in your design, if you're willing to deal with these systems in a playful way, say, gee, we're going to do something over the shoulder, we're going to do something like this, this, this. If you overthink something, very often you're, you're editing out your base creativity. So be careful about that. Remember all the half, that over half the jobs will be new. Stop to think about it for a minute. When Google's cars, understand that there's going to be 100 Google taxis in Las Vegas next year. No drivers. Remember, you know, Total Recall, Johnny Cab in Las Vegas. Now, I don't want you to rip him out if he does something wrong. <laughs> what happens to all the people that are currently driving cars, trucks, ambulances, if all of a sudden they're auto drive? It's going to happen within 10 years. So what are all those people going to do? Something different. Um, entrepreneurship is going to be huge. I think that uh, Frank talked a little bit about uh, MakerBots and 3D printing. Huge, huge change in the world. 
because now everybody can have a factory in the garage. And so all you have to do is design something, make it available, and ship it. Am I running out of time? Are you good? Am I good? Um, so every high school student should learn entrepreneurship, you know, building their own company, creating things. How do you actually create your own job? When you go to a company and say, please give me a job, you're a supplicant. When you say, I am going to create my own company, that's empowering. And I believe that there's going to be a place for both. But I think we really need to amp up the self-generation ideas of entrepreneurship and self-enthusiasm. We have a problem with the internet. <laughs> in that, and in, uh, there is a huge amount of information available to everybody today. And one of the issues that we have that we need to be careful about is our ability to climb into an intellectual silo and not be interfered with by people of differing opinions. This means that we are increasingly creating a politically unstable society. And uh, I would encourage everybody to try to reach across the aisle intellectually as much as you can and try to resolve some of the impasse that we're currently in. Anyway, we're shifting to merit. Just wanted to show you. This is a uh, school bus in Tokyo. This is a school bus in Bangladesh. Uh, and the question becomes one, do we want to transport kids to a school, or do we want them to walk to an a, a school system that's smaller, more local, and more effective? Walking to school isn't actually a, bit, a bad idea. Anyway, um, this is a little bit of a commercial. We're building software that is teaching kids right now Spanish vocabulary 10 times faster. Kids who use our software 10 minutes a day, three days a week in Spanish one, end up with a vocabulary of 1,500 words. And that's mastery. That's listening, spelling, uh, knowing it on the other side. So it's bilateral, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of languages are <laughs> unilateral. Reminds me sometimes when you construct a nice sentence in French and you ask a French cab driver and then all of a sudden the French comes rolling back at you and you have no clue. Um, anyway. Um, our Spanish one kids are winning the Spanish spell off uh, against Spanish three kids. So we know the stuff is working in, in language. This fall, we hope to have 100% of the curriculum as an adjunct. And this is, this is, think of it as a 10 minute adjunct to whatever the kids are learning three days a week. That's all we want. And we're doing it through crowdsourcing. And that's another big trend I want everybody to, to, to be aware of. Crowdsourcing is really an important thing. We will get all of our software for most of our software curriculum by teachers creating lessons. We're building the tools that use, that can take almost any information and plug it into the game dynamics that make it brain sticky. And so for you in the military, you can create brain rushes for a particular mission because you really want to know that everybody in your squad has 
a certain set of skills that you can test, make sure that they're there, because we integrate the test and, and the exposition. Remember, there's no exposition. It's all test, 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 test. Anyway. It turns out that if you are learning quickly, you think it's fun. It's really funny. And, and I'm not talking about pretty pictures or interesting stuff. We're 100% focused on, is it fast? We try to make it as fast as you can, and we're, we're finding funny little things, like the reveal. When you choose an answer, do you reveal immediately that the uh, answer is correct or incorrect? No, it turns out that brain science is better. You last somewhere but over 200 milliseconds. It may be a little more than that. We, we're, these are the sorts of things that we're testing. In the early days of Atari, we made games that earned more money than any of our competitors. Why? Because we cheated. <laughs> we had paper strip recorders in the bottom of our test machines, and so that we could tell the dynamics of when people blew out of their little round. And it turns out that there was some interesting math that we discovered. You wanted half the people to fail at any particular round. Not 40%, not 60%, but half. It seemed a little bit silly. But if we could scale it, and you could make things, tweak things a little easier, a little harder for each of the levels, we could hit that metric. We were the only people in the world who knew that. And we just turned that crank and tested it. And I can remember the number of times we'd open up a game. These were coin-op games. You know, where the more quarters in the box, the better off you were. And thank you very much for your contribution. <laughs> <laughs> Opening up the back of the box, just being confronted with the pile of strip chart paper, because back in those days, that's how we measured stuff. It's so much easier now, anyway. Thanks. One of my messages is really keep fun alive. Uh, if your training is not fun, you're screwing up. And you're screwing up badly, because we can constantly, even if you're just making it fun by having it go fast, you're going to be more effective. Our stuff, everyone can use it. Everything, everyone can improve it. And it's free. Huh? What's wrong with this? If it's better, if it's faster, and it's cheaper, that violates the sign that's on every, when I was growing up, every coffee shop had a sign that said, good food, good service, low prices, pick two. <laughs> and, uh, and so what, what we're doing is, trust me, don't worry about me making money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My, your, your sympathy is, is misdirected. Uh, but, uh, but we believe that the premium model really, really works. We'll have some premium content and things like that. But we believe that we can bring an exemplary education to the world through crowdsourcing. Think of it as the app store for education. Let me talk about Brain Rush Labs for a minute. Brain Rush Labs is just in its infancy. And, uh, and Frank said he wants us to give it a, a, a offering to it. But anyway, it's about taking it from 10 times faster to 20 times faster. And here's the trick. If we, <coughs> we can measure how fast an individual earns, 
how long it takes them to learn any concept to within a few seconds. That means the question of what are the conditions of precedent? What did they have for breakfast that morning? And if we, if one day they have a high protein breakfast and the next day they have a high carb breakfast, and one gives them a repeatable four second advantage, don't we want to know that? It turns out that exercise, before you learn, is really powerful. There's a test done at Columbia University in which 200 students were put into a testing environment. Half the students were allowed a half hour to cram before the test. The other half were put into PT, basically got their heart rate up, exercised aggressively. The students in the exercise side scored 15 percentage points higher than the cramming side. So, our high schools that are eliminating, you know, PE, it's really silly. But, and it's also silly to have seventh period or sixth period PE. You want to actually, if you want to design a school properly, you want to have PT, get your heart rate above 120, uh, above, uh, excuse me, above 80% of your max capacity. So you take your age, subtract, you know, 220, you take 80% of that. You need 20 minutes of that. That causes your brain to secrete BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This is a precursor protein to dendrite and axon growth. And though it hasn't been proven yet, there's several studies going on right now, we believe that when you learn after your brain is flooded with BDNF, some of it is actually going into hardware your dendrites. And we, can, we know that when you do a certain amount of exercise and learning, I mean, remember, we're paleo men. And we were, as men, we were running, walking 30 miles a day. If you're a paleo woman, you only had to walk or run six miles a day. And that's one of the reasons they believe that ADHD is so prevalent in young boys and not so prevalent in women. And so exercise, it turns out, remediates an awful lot of that. But we can do that. But also, we know that learning has to do a lot with how the rest and your quality of rest. There's some differences in gender, you know, in terms of that. Schema. What do you know about the schema? Schema is a framework in which you plan ideas and new concepts. So for example, if you love baseball, any data, fact, any data, any information about baseball is going to be easier for you to remember than things about quantum mechanics. But if somehow you've got a passion for quantum mechanics and you have a requisite schema, that becomes easier. I think we can quantify that in some interesting ways. Of course, enthusiasm, trauma, time of day, all of these things need to be measured and they need to put a number on it. I had an old professor in my engineering school who said, if you can't put a number on something, you don't know it at all. Up till then, it's a theory, it's a guess. So my guesses right now are that we are going to be able to tell you exactly how much protein you should have for breakfast. And it may be different for you based on your blood type, based on your genome, uh, based on this, the, your time of day. Um, and we will know these things, and every student can be fine-tuned. Every soldier can be fine-tuned based on the type of exercise, the type of nutrition, the type of rest. And everybody can become more proficient and capable. So that's brain rush. 
And this is my book. This is a, this is a, a unfettered commercial. It's a really good book. <laughs> it was written, you know, I gotta tell you. Okay, I am a lunatic, but the thing that's fun about being a lunatic is that you do some different things. And my objective has always been to stay playful, to stay mentally plastic. And it turns out that when you do different things every day, you maintain mental plasticity. I've got another company called Anti-Aging Games. And it's how to keep, keep your brain functional as you get older and older. Well, one of the theories that I saw was to play the dice game. Now, the dice game is something that you have to do, and from now on, this is a homework assignment, everybody has to play the dice game. Now, you have to play it tonight when you get home, or maybe tomorrow. And then you have to do it January 1, every day, every year, for the rest of your life. And the dice game goes as follows. You have to list 11 things that you don't think you can do, or that you don't think you should do, or, well, not, not, something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and write them down on slips of paper. Mix them up, put a number next to each one of them, 2 through 12. Then you take two dice, throw them, and you have to, in the next year, do that thing. Now, the reason I bring this up is that January 1, 2012, I threw, no, excuse me, it was 2011. I threw the dice, and it came up, write a book. Okay, I've always thought of myself as a scientist and a, and a businessman and an engineer, and I almost flunked freshman English. I cannot spell. I would be considered illiterate in most countries if my wife didn't correct my prose. And so writing a book to me sounded about as foreign as you could possibly do. But I said, okay, the dice told me to do it, I have to do it, so I'll do as good a job as I can. And I like to read science fiction, so I, I wrote a science fiction book. It was horrible. <laughs> um, I sent a copy of it to my daughter, who was a cum laude graduate from, from Berkeley. And she said, Dad, this is a science, it's kind of an interesting story, but it reads like stereo instructions. Um, <laughs> You really need to get a bucket full of adjectives that just sort of describe stuff. You know, they walked into a building. What kind of a building? What color was it? You know, what was the environment like? You know, you know. So I did that. I, I got a couple of buckets of adjectives and I just sort of got it, made it kind of flowery. I made it longer than I wanted it to be, but it was awesome. And uh, and pretty soon people are saying, hey, you know, Nolan, that's kind of a good book. Now, all authors have to be careful of false positives because your friends will always say, God, what a talented and handsome guy you are. Um, <laughs> don't believe it true. Um, and so then I started working on all this application. I thought, hey, now that I'm an author, I'm going to write down all the stuff that I've researched and, and do that. So I've got a book called Hybrid School of the Future. And it started being pretty good, and I thought, well, it'll be good for, this, for the, my project. And so I actually thought, maybe I can get this puppy published. I went out, and sure enough, everybody that I showed it to said no. Uh, <laughs> save one. And I went to one publisher who said, Nolan, it's a great book, but I don't think it should be your first one. Um, and uh, he said, but what you should do is write a book about creativity and a business book. That's what you have gravitas in. And he said, and since you're 
And, you know, since books about Steve Jobs right now are hot, why don't we, I've got the title for you. He says, it's Finding the Next Steve Jobs, about creativity, how you can find the creative, because everybody is kind of looking for what happens. You know, Apple, through its creative products, got to be the biggest market cap company in the world. They said, all businesses want to do that. I said, oh, okay. He says, not only that, I think we need, I've, I've got a guy that can actually write and that I want you to work with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes being complimented with faint praise is, is worse than having somebody say, no one of you really suck. <laughs> so anyway, but it turns out that that's okay. You kind of got to get over yourself. Um, and if anything, I can tell you is get over yourself. If somebody has spent their life training to be a good writer and they want to turn your ideas into readable text, that's a good thing. And so Gene Stone and I got together and he turned out to be a great guy and we've become great friends because of it. And he actually took my words, and it, and it actually sounds like, it, it actually sounds like it came from me. I mean, it did come from me, but it actually sounds that way. That's a real talent. And so uh, we came up with a book, and I think it's pretty good. It's a little irreverent. I can't believe that it came from me being a little irreverent. But anyway, uh, I want you to all, this is another homework assignment. I want you to buy 20 books each and give them to all your friends. <laughs> they will love you for it. And I'm sure that uh, by you doing that, you will get all kinds of kudos, better things on your birthday. It'll, you know, it'll, it'll come back to you many fold, trust me. Anyway, um, thank you for your time. Does anybody want to uh, give me a question or two? I wasn't that complete. <laughs> uh, in your talk, how do you get leadership, people who are actually running the show, making the big decisions, to Change. They've been doing it this way for 20 years. That's the way we want to do it. I'm here to teach them. They're here to learn not to play games. The mentality is it's a game, not a learning tool. My book talks a lot about how you create a creative infrastructure. If the boss does not want to change. The first step is to buy one of my books and give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> if he refuses to read it or adopt anything, then covert assassination is possible. <laughs> uh, it's a black op, so uh, I, I shouldn't do that. But. Uh, uh, when I was talking about the perfect storm, perfect storms do some interesting things. They kind of loosen up the set gel because when everybody else is moving and innovating, all of a sudden people start, who are very, very Luddite, you know, who are the Luddites of society, all of a sudden start to feel like they're maybe alone. And that's one thing. The second thing is very often their market cap drops to the point where they get booted out. You know, remember, Steve Jobs got booted out of Apple because he kept trying too many things. The idiots that took over from him almost bankrupted Apple. Apple, Apple brought Steve back when it was basically a step, you know, a half a step away from bankruptcy. 
And to go from there to the highest market cap company in the world based on innovation. What idiot would think that a computer company should get into the music business? <laughs> you know? Think about it. You know, Packard didn't do it. Dell didn't do it. Apple did. And all of a sudden, most of the revenue comes from product lines that didn't exist before. Well, their base product line of computers and tablets are, are starting to eclipse other sources of business. Um, I think that we are in for a wild ride in the next little while. I mean, we're, things are moving so quickly. The people who are resistant to change will start feeling very, very uncomfortable and painful. And that's good. Yes? So, um, I have a I, I'm really hard at hearing. Yeah, OK. Um, you know, I study the brain. I'm an anthropologist, evolution, why, we, why we're so plastic. The brain is oriented towards finding patterns, right? right? And once it finds patterns, it stays within those patterns. So one of the opportunities I see in the gaming industry, one of the reasons why I'm here, is, is using games to get people out of their comfort zones. And I was wondering if you had thought about that and uh, you know what you might offer to us about yeah. helping people get across cultural barriers and into different comfort Because that's where it, Sure. The innovation is going to happen. Well, the basic question was how, uh, games can, can help kid, kid people out of their comfort zone. Yes and no. One of the things you have to be very careful about is games sometimes can be too much of a comfort zone. And uh, there's a lot of people that I would consider to be life deficient because of emphasis on video games. Uh, if you have a 13-year-old male, there's a high probability that given total free reign, they would opt for an IV and game playing 24-7. <laughs> uh, sometimes I think we've done our job too well. Uh, we do look for patterns. We look for secure structures that are predictable. It's death on our brain, but it makes us feel good. It's very interesting to go to your high school reunion. And if you look closely, you'll find that at every point in time, the people that you went to high school with at various times have died from the neck up. They have basically tuned out at various times. And, and you don't realize that until you sit down and you have, a, you, know, you have dinner with them at the reunion the and you find out they're still telling the same jokes and, and reliving their high school days. You know, get old. I can tell you right now that I think the dice game is maybe one of the most important things that I've discovered in the last four years. And I wish I'd have discovered it 20 years soon. So, that's your homework assignment. You have to do it. Um, otherwise, you will be marked dead. I want to everyone to thank uh, Nolan and give a big round of applause. Thank you.